incomprehensible to the people who speak a different one. We can only see that because we've got a standard of comparison. That was William Jones's argument. He had all these languages out there. Let's imagine sometime in the future, and it may be upon us sooner than we might have think, might think, where there's only one language in the world. It might be English, it might be Chinese, I don't think it'll be Welsh, but everybody speaks the same language, and just to make life simple, we bur get rid of all the fossils by burning all the books, okay? Uh, or we put everything onto disks, and then the format changes and we can't read them. So we're all <laughs> speaking one language. Well, William Jones could then have never have done his work. There was no way that we could see that languages are related to each other, that they evolved, that they have a structure, a grammar which makes sense, that they change at a certain rate. Because we only have one unique language, we can say nothing about its past. And that really seems to me to solve the problem that so many creationists have. They're worried about our unique attributes, our sense of consciousness, our sense of being our sense of responsibility, our senses of words, things like love, if you want to use that. We can't measure, these may exist in other creatures, but we can't measure them. So we can't use science, evolutionary biology, to explain them. In some ways, actually, I think evolution has a limit, and we've stepped beyond it. I have no problem with the, um, with the uh, line which the previous pope took, which struck me as really rather sensible, which effectively what, that there is, there was an evolving lineage of primates, and at some time, by supernatural means, that gained a soul, um, uh, which was put into that line, which made it human. Now, I would say it gained a language, but I don't know that for sure, and as the soul has no DNA and leaves no fossils, um, it's not really um, accessible to study by science. So, um, a question that's beyond science has no means for science to disprove it, or to put it in slightly less elevated terms, um, uh, science can tell you everything you need to know about yourself, apart from the interesting stuff, that is. And that's really why creationism is wrong and evolution is right. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Steve. Um, it was a fascinating um, and very complete coverage of a very complex subject. Um, I think you are prepared to take a few questions. I'll take, I'll take questions, but I won't take speeches from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. There's your guideline. Now, we have two microphones, um, uh, one for each section of the room. And what we like to do so that we can coordinate the questions is to get two questions lined up uh, at one time. So is there anybody on this side who would like to ask a question? Oh, there's one here. Sarah, would you come here? And is there anyone on this side? There's one here. Uh, I think actually it's no, uh, Sarah, it's at the front here. And then we'll go back to that. It's, this was the first hand I saw. Uh, Lewis, uh, here. And then this one. Yes. Yep. It's, work, it's working. It's working? Yep. Oh, I can only tell myself. <laughs> Steve, no, just by simple question, do you think evolution always goes gradually or occasionally in big jumps? The old question of evolution by creeps or evolution by jerks, you mean. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was the Steve Gould comment on that. Um, it's hard to know. Um, my own feel, I'm, I'm rather a creep, I have to tell you. Um, because people who look in the fossil record often see big jumps in the fossil record, and that happens. But when you ask how long those jumps took to, to happen, it's often thousands and thousands or longer years. So, you know, what's a jump to a paleontologist is a creep to a biologist. Um, so my own feeling, I'm a sort of, I have a re refreshingly conventional view of evolution, which is a very Darwinian one, that it's slow. Having said that, there clearly have been cases where there have been great leaps. A classic one, uh, one of the standard creationist things I get all the time, which is that there is less information now in the genes than there was long ago. I don't know where they get that idea from. It just <coughs> decays. But that's not true, because you can see many cases where the entire genome, the entire set of genes, has doubled up in human evolution, or mammal evolution, probably four times over the last several hundred million years. In case we think we're really smart, salmon and trout have got another doubling beyond us. So uh, you can have sudden things like that, but they're rare. 
Thank you. So there was one here, and then the next question was this gentleman who, who was there. You I can ask yeah. to stand up. <laughs> um, can you explain this to a non-scientist? Something I've never really understood about evolution is um, about the place of intelligence when it comes, for example, to the humans behaving, uh, changing their behaviour in response to understanding about the way the HIV virus is transmitted, for example. That seems to be an intelligent response. In, and, and then about random selection. Yeah. Oh, well, clearly it is an intelligent response. There are lots of things that humans do which make no evolutionary sense at all. The classic example of evolutionary madness is called Italy, right? <laughs> and I don't mean particularly the, the, today's election. The average completely fam complete family size in Italy is 1.2. So... 200 years from now, no more, no more spaghetti, no Italians. <laughs> um, now, you, however hard I think, I cannot make an evolutionary explanation of why people, and that includes you, most of Western Europe, will choose to have fewer offspring than necessary to replace their own populations. Now, so people are doing that for reasons which are anti-evolutionary, really, uh, and not necessarily, of course, intelligent. So I think we just have to accept that an awful thing, a lot of things that we do are not actually programmed by evolution. Um, a rather less attractive example of that is the observation, which there is quite a lot of evidence for, is that male rapists have more children than male non-rapists. Okay? So if you're a naive sociobiologist, and by definition there are only naive sociobiologists, <laughs> um, um, the, the, the natural thing to do is to go out and do some raping. Well, of course, that's entirely unacceptable anywhere. Um, so I think we, you know, it's not a matter of intelligence. It's a matter, I don't know what the word I would use for, conscious, consciousness almost, of what you should and what should not do. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I, think, I think it was a pretty good attempt to answer the question. <laughs> is it um, is there, there? Just before you start, is there somebody on this side who would like to ask the next for, question? For the next one, yeah. Yes, a, a lady down here. They'll bring the microphone to you and then... Sir. Well, uh, slightly disagree with you about... Is a question coming up, sir? Uh, slightly disagree with you about evolution having a, having a line to it. Because our conditions are changing and we're changing the additions, isn't just uh, evolution just to know another word for just environmental effects well, on I think, human? Well, I think you're right to say that evolution doesn't have a line to it. Okay? Darwin himself wrote in The Origin, never say higher or lower. Okay? I mean, a beautiful example of perfectly adapted evolution is the tapeworm. And all the tapeworm is a, is a sack of guts and genitals, okay? It can't really said, be said to have gone any higher. If you look at the past, there have been five separate occasions. The biggest one at the end of the Permian era, 241 million years ago, um, where, because of global warming, in fact, almost every species went extinct. Whole organisms, whole groups of creatures disappeared. And so life got much simpler. So the notion that somehow evolution is progress, which ends, of course, with white European males, and that was the notion that was common in, in evolutionary thought as recently as the 1950s, it's simply wrong. It's not true. Evolution, if, any, if there's anything predictable about evolution, is that it's entirely unpredictable. You know, I'm making all this blithe nonsense about, you know, we're, we're all going to survive and evolution isn't going to affect us much anymore. I could well be entirely wrong. Some new plague will appear and... 99% of us will go. I hope it won't happen. But evolution is not going to tell you whether or not that's going to happen. Thank you. So now we need another question on this side of the house. Uh, for, for, uh, yes, there's Darren here. And there's one ready. Here. Uh, yes, this one is ready, and then this Darren will come afterwards. Um, yeah. What about Lamarck and the inheritance of quad, um, characteristics? 